Good morning um, and welcome to the progress, Progressive Migration to Drupal 10 um, session. Thank you for being here. Um, my name is uh, Mayela Jackson and oh, uh, I'm a little bit. So my name is Mayela Jackson and I have a background uh, as a civil engineer. I've been building things uh, and nowadays building web applications. I worked for uh, CDC and now working for Department of Justice with ATF and I read a lot about physics and neuroscience. So that's me. You're Steven Cross, my co-developer. Hey everybody. Well, welcome to our walk-in refrigerator. <laughs> the beef is on this side, the produce is on that side. Um, I've been doing Drupal work uh, since Drupal 6. I've been with the Department of Justice for eight years. Uh, have you ever heard of the podcast Talking Drupal? If you haven't, check it out. Um, I'm the founder and was the host of that for 300 episodes. Now I kind of work in the background. Uh, so check that out if you haven't. I'm a Linux and Raspberry Pi enthusiast. If you'd like to talk about that at some point in time, track me down. And I'm going to turn this back over to Magella. We also want to thank you to the sponsors and the organizers who put this great event together. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, let me talk about the agency that we work with is uh, ATF, which is the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Farms, and Explosives. Has uh, 25 field divisions and 250 local offices. It has 6,000 employees, special agents, and IOIs. Now let's talk about uh, the website. Uh, it's www.atf.gov. It's a public website. It is an essential resource for law enforcement and the public. It provides access to regulations, licensing forms, news and information for, uh, the, for the law enforcement uh, efforts. And also off offers guidance uh, in, for firearms and explosive safety and legal compliance. It allows users to submit tips and learn about the career opportunities at ATF. Now, let me introduce the team that we work with. It's the ATF Web Media Branch. It's the team uh, within the agency that is responsible for managing the digital communication efforts. It's a small team of content editors, content writers, and developers. And this small team is in charge of maintaining and updating all the content on the, the website. Now today, we're going to go through uh, the Drupal 7 site that is a 10-year-old uh, site and the process of migration that we uh, are doing to migrate to Drupal 10. And we're gonna um, understand what is this process with this progressive migration and why we went this way to implement this method or process and how we did it. And uh, as a civil engineer, uh, for me, um, I'm going to use an, an analogy that is related to uh, um, <coughs> my, my background. But before we go to that analogy, we, uh, I have to say that the website www.atf.gov is a living, breathing website, meaning that we couldn't have the luxury of shutting it down while we're doing the migration. It has 25 field divisions and 20, 250 local offices that they, they go to the website to look for information. Daily press releases are published from Department of Justice and from ATF. 
information about assets from feature, state trace reports, and it's uh, updated monthly. There is uh, 500,000 visitors per month and 625,000 visits per month. So it takes a full team to keep the site going and uh, has uh, like 30K pages. But it needs to upgrade. It needs to upgrade, it's been 10 years and uh, we need to have a new design and reorganize the content, um, add some new features and functions, and of course, Drupal 7 is retiring, so we need to <laughs> migrate it to Drupal 10. So we have a problem. So how do we keep this site running while migrating to a new site with the same resources. And then the solution that we found is to move the site one session at a time with progressive migration. And then here's in my analogy that I think is a, a familiar to all of us that is like moving from one house to another. So let's pretend that the Drupal 7 site is a house that has a gavel, a roof structure, basic shapes and styles, and is painted with lead paint. Yeah, it's been 10 years. So, and the, the floor plan of this Drupal 7 house, uh, imagine that the floor plan is the information architecture of your site has these different rooms, which would be the sections of the site. The furniture on the sections uh, is, uh, imagine it's a uh, page content. And the room arrangement is the page layout. So now the new house is the house for Drupal 10. So this house from the outside is similar to the previous one, to the Drupal 7 site has an identical roof structure, similar basic shapes and style, and is lead free paint. So it's good. So the two houses, they uh, are located in different streets, and they have their own addresses, and they have different lots. As you can see, the 2.10 house has a bigger lot because we're thinking that it's going to expand over time. But the houses are built differently. The Drupal 7 house has an old foundation method. You know, it's Drupal 7 core. Has lead paint. Lead paint is using a thing, but it's not using the latest uh, government design system and it has cast iron plumbing system which you, you know that it could cause uh, a leaks in the future. So the Drupal 10 house is, has a new foundation, strong foundation. You can go and, and fix it really quick and has left paint and has a PVC plumbing system. Wow, it's kind of cool, modern house. But on the outside, it looks similar to the Drupal 7 side. The floor plan of Drupal 10 house, it looks the same. So using the same architecture, uh, information architecture. All the rooms are located in the same place as in the Drupal 7 side. And you go around at the floor plan, and then you see, you find your way easy, and there is no changes there. But you may notice some updated features fresh paint, you know, new windows, and tiny sort of things. Now, progressive migration means like we're gonna migrate the site from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 in sessions. So we're going to migrate, uh, the, we're going to do the move 
one room at a time. You know the whole house. Why? Because that way we can manage our resources, the human resources and time. So that, that was the, the, why we did progressive missing, migration. So let's meet Scott. Scott is the person, the user, that is going to help us to explain how this progressive migration works. Scott is uh, here that we have the two floor plans, the Drupal 7 for you is on the left and the Drupal 10 is on the right. So as you see, Drupal 7 has all the rooms with all the furniture and Drupal 10 only has one room with furniture. But you can see that the layout is a little bit different. But the, the content, the furniture is the same. So Scott is in the, at the entrance of Drupal 7 site, and he said, you know what, I want to explore this site. I'm going to go to the bathroom one. So he goes there, and he stands at the front of the door of the bathroom one, and he gets transported to the other house, to the Drupal 10 house. How? Huh? I don't know. We're going to answer that in a few. So now Scott is in the Drupal 10 house. He's so excited because it's a clean house, it's beautiful, oh my gosh. And he get, gets curious, he goes to the kitchen. And he's standing at the front door of the kitchen and he gets in and appears on the other house, on the Drupal 7 house. How? How is this happening? Oh, well, kind of spooky. I have an answer. <laughs> I have an answer. Uh, it's a magical portal. <laughs> but I'm going to let my uh, friend Stephen explain the technical aspects of this magical portal. Okay, a small task describing how to use and create a magical portal. So what we're going to do is let's going to start um, with some sysop stuff, one of my favorite topics. And we're going to describe a couple of servers for us that's going to help us create this magical portal. So we have an origin server. An origin server is the server that your website's hosted from. If you don't have a CDN in front of your website, then every web request goes to the origin server and there's, the request is served. We also have, at our model, we have edge servers. So an edge server is part of a CDN, a content delivery network, like Cloudflare, Akamai, CloudFront. The object of the edge server is to pull content from the origin server and deliver it to your visitor. The origin server is the only one accessing, sorry, the CDN server is the only one accessing your origin server. The edge servers are placed throughout the world or throughout the country and when your visitors access your website, they're accessing it through the edge server. The edge server is talking to your origin server to get content. So the result of that is that the performance is better for your visitors because they're accessing servers that are closest to them and there's a lot less work on your origin server because it's only serving content to the edge servers. And it's improved security as well. So you can see in this diagram, we've got the CDN in the middle, He's talking to your origin server, and the CDN is talking to the edge servers. Put my coffee down so I can kick it in a few minutes. <laughs> so the next concept I want to talk about is the idea of a dual or multiple origin configuration. This is used often for high traffic websites where you need more than one origin server to deliver the content to the CDN. 
You can see in this diagram, the only change from the previous one is we've got two origin servers. We actually use the dual origin as our magical portal. But we use it slightly different. We're not trying to divvy up the content going to the CDN through multiple origin servers. What we're doing is we're using origin one for our Drupal 7 site, the old house, and we're using origin two for our Drupal 10 server, the new house. And the job of the CDN in this configuration is to figure out where to pull the content from when a request comes in. So in our example for today, a room that we've moved over, that bedroom, is gonna be the careers section of the website. And the way the CDN determines which server to pull from is very simple, it's the path. So when the CDN sees a path that starts with careers, either the landing career page or any page underneath it, it pulls that content from origin two instead of origin one. One other thing I just want to mention here is, is access, who has access to what. The way our network is set up for our web environment is the public can only see the CDN and the edge servers. Even if they know the IP addresses of the origin server, they can't get to them. We have our network split up, so only the internal people at the ATF can see the two origin servers. So if I'm sitting in my office at the ATF, or if I'm on the VPN, I can actually get to www.atf, which is the Drupal 10 site, but no public person can do that. So, we talked a little bit earlier about the old house and the new house. So on the screen now, you see on the left-hand side, you see the About Us page in Drupal 7. This is coming from the old house. It's Drupal 7. It's everything that Drupal 7 is all about, lead paint, etc. And on the right-hand side, we're pulling content from Origin 2, which is Drupal 7. So on this side, this is where we have um, made decisions about, hey, what are we going to use for page layout? We're using the latest version of Drupal. We're using the latest versions of PHP. But if you'll notice here, we've made a decision that the design of these two sites, the 7 and 10, are going to be very similar for the time being. Because we want to transition, because we're transitioning one room at a time, we don't want a user to go through a dramatic change when they switch between the two origins or the two websites. So we keep kept the design similar, and you can see they're not exactly the same. It's part of our design goal. After we move all the rooms, we're going to make more dramatic changes to the design. But we're going to take them one piece at a time. For example, if you look at the headers here, the top is Drupal 7. You can see it kind of looks, if you squint your eyes, it kind of looks like the D10 header. We've kept the colors all the same. The fonts are close and not exactly the same. And we've got the main menu items roughly in the same position in the header. So it's not clear to the user. It's not even clear to me sometimes which site I'm on. Um, I have to really pay attention to see if I'm on D10 or D7, which will become a problem at some point for us. Um, you'll also notice that, you should notice on the right-hand side, that we've implemented US design standards. You can see that by the flag that appears at the top of the header. So that's one of the theme changes we've made in D10. If we look at the footers, the footers really don't look anything alike. They both have blue in them. This is the Drupal 7 footer, this is the Drupal 10 footer. There's links at the bottom, but the footers are designed differently, but that's not really a dramatic change for our users to even notice. So you see that we've got a really slight transition from people switching between Drupal 7 and Drupal 10, because they're jumping between the rooms in this magic magical portal, we don't want it to be too drastic for them. So let's move on to how we did this. Well, you know we've implemented with dual origins, and that's working good, but we did run into some technical challenges. And the reason why I use the word challenges, it's not because they were hard problems to solve, as you'll see. All the problems are very similar, but they're challenging because these are all things that Drupal just takes care of by default. And as soon as we implemented this model, it didn't take care of it anymore. So we're now trying to fix things that we typically wouldn't have to fix. Here's one of them, common paths. 
So everyone is probably familiar with what this path is, sites, default files. By default on a Drupal site, this is the location where your public files are stored. So when a user uploads a file in Drupal 7, in this case image one, on our Drupal 7 site, it goes up to this location, sites, default files, image dash one. Without any changes, and the way we discover this problem is when someone uploads a file in Drupal 10, it goes to the same path. Well, there's a problem here. The problem is when we go to display those files. When we go to display these files to the public, remember that the CDN is deciding where to pull content from. I've only told it every time it sees the path slash careers to go to origin 2. But if you notice here, I have the same path pointing to images on the D10 server as I do the D7 server. So as a result, image not found. Or it could be worse than that, it could be an image that I'm not expecting because the file name was the same. So there's an easy way to fix this. And it's gonna be a similar fix we're gonna see in other issues. It's we change the default location of where files are stored in D10. We change that default to site's default files to. And then we put a rule in the CDN that says anytime you see files 2 in the path, go to origin 2 instead of origin 1. Fixes the problem. And there are other problems related to common paths that are going to come up. CSS files, JavaScript files, modules store CSS and JavaScript files in places. So the, the fix for this is always the same. The Drupal 10 paths need to be unique. Let's talk about the next little challenge we had. This wasn't a, a technical challenge, but a mental challenge to figure out what the heck was going on. So we're gonna talk about redirects for a second. So we've migrated our career section over to Drupal 10. So when a user puts in the, the URL slash careers, we know now that the CDN is gonna recognize that path, pull the content over from the origin to. But over time, you have redirects that are created. So you see in Drupal 7 side on the left, there were two, in this example, two redirects. One, about slash careers goes to careers. And then the second one, careers slash info goes to careers. But this migration, like any other migration, when you migrate content over, you also migrate the redirects. So I now have redirects on both origin one, D7, and origin to D10. So what happens when someone goes to those redirects? This is what happens. So the first redirect, the about careers, it's the same rule always. The CDN looks at the path and says, has this, where do I pull this content from? I'm gonna pull this content from origin one because it's not careers. So the D D7 redirect fires off first, which redirects the user to slash careers which goes to the CDN again, and then it serves the correct page from Drupal 10. Make sense? Let's look at the second redirect. The user now puts in careers slash info. Same rule applies. CDN looks at the path, sees that it's careers, and goes to the origin to directly, and then serves the page from origin to. So the point of this is when you get into this model where you're managing two sites and content is coming from two places, you're gonna to have to think about the path that things are taking so you understand what's going on. The next challenge, uh, sitemaps. So a sitemap um, is a file that has a list of your pages that you want a search engine to index. The issue we have here is now we have two origins two different websites that we want Google and Bing and all the other engines to index. So how are we gonna handle that? So a sitemap file comes in two structures. The one on the left is kind of the way you think of a sitemap file. It's simply a list of URLs. I've left out the XML out of this to keep the example simple. But these are all the pages that I want the search engine to index. There's another structure for an XML file uh, for a sitemap that's called a sitemap index. And that basically is like a table of contents. When a search engine sees that, it's a directory of where the other sitemap files are located. So we use a combination of these two structures 
to set up our site maps for these two origins. And it's pretty straightforward how we do it once you figure out what's going on again. So what we do in origin one is we set up an index, that table of contents that says, hey, when you hit origin one, which the search engine will do by default because it's gonna be looking in your root directory for a sitemap.xml file, unless you told it to look somewhere else, but we haven't. So it's looking in that location, and we set up an index file there that says, hey, look at all of these sitemaps on Drupal 7, and the last thing to do is, hey, go over to this other origin and look at the sitemaps there as well. So we tell the CDN, the, the, the sitemap file on the second origin needs to be found by the CDN, so we put it in a special directory called sitemap, and then we tell the CDN, whenever you see slash sitemap, you know to go to origin two. So the end result of this is when the sitemap gets loaded by a search engine in D7, the last step it does is it points over to the sitemap in D10. You see a similar theme with all these issues. It's managing where things are located. The last challenge that I want to mention is base URL, which is a pretty important variable in PHP that Drupal uses. It identifies the domain of the website. So on origin one, our D7 site, the base URL variable is set to atf.gov. On origin two, it's set to www.atf.gov. And keep in mind, I mentioned earlier that the public does not have access to www2. They'll get a page not found or an access denied message. So the issue we're trying to solve here is that whenever the D10 is generating content in markup, core and custom modules use that variable called base URL. And so pages coming from D10 could have a www2 injected into them. A couple of examples of that is whenever Drupal does a redirect, in the header of the page that it sends back, it uses the base URL variable to identify where to re redirect to. So we had to write a little bit of custom code to catch these cases. Like on a redirect, on the Drupal 10 side, when it says www2, we change it to www. We get the same, we found the same problem when you embed a video with the video embed in media. It puts an iframe in the code. In that iframe, it uses the base URL. So on Drupal 10, it embeds www2. We just wrote some code to change that to www, and it's done. So base URL is something you have to pay attention to, and your success and failure, this will vary depending on the modules you're using. Again, not a real challenge to fix. You just need to know that it exists and fix it. I'm going to turn this back over to Magello. Are you warm? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, yeah, uh, we also had some content challenges uh, that our content admins and editors had to deal with. Uh, confusion. Confusion, if I uh, have to edit a page in Drupal 10, where should I go? We have two admin websites. One is the, to admin, uh, for administration of the Drupal 7 site, and the other one is to administer the content for Drupal 10. Sometimes it gets confused. Uh, gets a uh, confusion, and um, so solution to that could be, well, you can put a sticky note on your desktop and say, hey, remember, go to this site to edit the pages in Drupal 10, go to the other site to edit the pages in Drupal 7. But there are other uh, solutions, like uh, you can set user permissions, or you can use a contrib module to kind of manage that uh, situation, or write, write some com custom code. You probably also could add some fields to the content type, say identification of uh, this content is on Drupal 10, this content is on Drupal 7. Or you just content that has been migrated, you just remove it, unpublished, and that will solve the problem. Other challenges that we had 
was like a project management. So managing the expectation of stakeholders. You know, some sections of the site, uh, they did their teams, and in our, our example, farms team, maybe they will say, oh, I want this feature, or I want to have this campaign on, and the project leader needs to say, hey, we are migrating the site, and uh, we want to do new features, but not now. So the scheduling of the new features and content is something that is a challenge for the project manager and then it's always in this constant battle. No battle, but it's in the constant conversations and communication with the stakeholders. Hold on, we will upgrade your section, but not, not now. We cannot do the migration. There are other challenges for developers. Maintaining two servers, maintaining two good bases. So sometimes I, most of the time, I'm benefiting on top of 10 code base, and I like it. It's clean, it's, it's elegant. I mean, in terms of the code, uh, well organized, the modules are so good, core is fantastic. Uh, and I have to do something on Drupal 7. So I go to that code base and I find myself in this ocean that is, oh, I see the code and it's so different and scary because it's old. So should I find a patch for this module? Oh my gosh, I just wish I can have it on Drupal 10. Where there is another module with a better patch, and oh my gosh, and then a software problem. So those challenges that we are dealing with as a developer. Basically, uh, we have one foot on Drupal 7 side of code, and then another foot on the Drupal 10 code base. So we have to bounce between the two code bases. But, I mean, we're still here. We have a good mental health, so We've been doing it, and the solution is just like that. Uh, breathe in, breathe out, and then uh, understanding that, you know, where things are. If you have to fix something for Drupal 7, you just spin out the Drupal 7 uh, site, um, you local, and if you do have to do the same on Drupal 10, you do it um, uh, on the Drupal 10 Google page. Testing, 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 testing. Just before, uh, back to the analogy with the houses, uh, before we migrated any content, we migrated uh, the, we, we created the foundation. So we installed Drupal 10, we put the USWBS design system in place, we created the navigation, and we started to test there, back and forth, from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10. No content. We're just going, testing all the navigations, making sure that the portal is working. So testing, testing, testing. After we felt comfortable that the connection between the two sites were established and working, we said, OK, let's move the first room. But we're going to start with a small room because we need to test more. And we have a small team, so let's go with a small room so the team can have the time to test and test and test. So test for redirects as in any migration, test for broken links as in any migration. Use automatic tools but don't rely on them. Humans are better testers. Write your user acceptance testing instructions. Go by them. Test, test, test. That's my, the best advice I can tell you uh, doing this. And since we are doing one section at a time, the testing gets smaller. Like, uh, it's not that we're gonna test the whole site, just 
narrow to that little section. Okay, so now I'm going to pass it to Stephen. Okay. So two major steps when putting this progressive migration into place. The first one was building the new house. This was a very developer-heavy process. It took us the longest of this project. It's the time that we had to set up the dual origins, uh, work with the CDN partner to get that piece working. Um, and we had all the new development steps that you can do for any project. So you need to do your content modeling, because you can have new content types, restructured content types. We're gonna pick a theme, but we're gonna use one out of the box, or we're gonna develop one. Well, we developed one for us. We're gonna integrate USWDS. We're also going to pick a page layout strategy we're gonna use. We're gonna use layout builder, we're gonna use paragraphs. What are we gonna do? All of that work happens when you build the new house. We haven't put any rooms in the house yet or decorated them, but so that was a big piece of the project. Once that piece is done, then we had to pick the first room. What is the first room gonna be? Well, we wanted it to be an easy room to move. Easy for us meant low risk, like if something went wrong or something broke, uh, it wouldn't be a, a big deal. Well, it wouldn't be a big deal, but a lesser big deal, <laughs> a smaller big deal. Um, and the way we determined that was like, look at the metrics. What, what pieces of the site are the least traveled and don't change that often. So mostly static content. So we ended up picking the careers section and a few other sections. But we're just talking about the careers today. Um, and then you have to coordinate with the stakeholders. Like, hey, we're gonna move this. Uh, we can't have some changes for a short period of time, but once we get it over to the new house, you'll be able to do some redecorating. And it turns out right after we moved that bedroom over, there's a major redecorating going on, which is really good for us because it's now it's being done in the new house. We're not gonna redecorate an old house and then do it again in the new house. Now for our remaining rooms, we have a little bit different strategy because now the developers, the, the heavy lift is done. The developers have moved from building the house to doing some remodeling. So now as we move new rooms over, we can do it strategically in terms of where do we want some of the new features. We have a big, long new feature list that's been growing for 10 years. So we're gonna put those in the new house. Now we can spend our time making the site better. So when people transfer over to the new site, they start to see new features. So that's the position we're currently in in the project, that we're moving other rooms and then we're enhancing the site at the same time. Again, it's heavily coordinating with stakeholders to figure out what their plans are for the content and the things they'd like to see. So some of the benefits of progressive migration, one of them, the big one for us is more time to migrate. It gave us a, a bigger path to work within. Um, and we could balance the effort of the maintenance and the migration at the same time. So, hey, this sprint, these next two sprints, we're gonna focus on some stuff for D10. The following sprint, we need to jump back on some things for Drupal 7. So that bouncing back and forth is something that we do regularly, and over time, we're doing more and more of the D10 stuff. Also, people see progress quicker. So people can now see the, the, the new, some new enhancements and some design changes on the D10 site right away. The very first time when the first bedroom moves over, the first room, you, they start to see the site changing. And, as I mentioned earlier, we get to have slower implementation of visual and functional changes. We're not dropping them from the old site right into the new site with all the new stuff. Our visitors have for many, many years been looking for the same content in the same places and seeing it the same way. So using this strategy, we get to slowly change some of those design aspects for them and, and take them on the journey with us to the new site. And the one thing I want to mention, too, is that this strategy is not just for migration. This progressive migration and using dual origins could be used in many ways. So uh, one example could be if you have a section of your site that's going to be on a completely different technology stack. It's not Drupal. It's something different. This is a great way to implement that. 
Or if you have a major redesign, you, have a, you currently have a Drupal 10 site, but there's a section that's gonna be completely redesigned and you need to launch it on a particular day. You could stage that and get it all set up on a dual or on the second origin. The day you need to go live, you switch to turn the dual origin on, they're seeing the new stuff and then you can slowly move that back over to the new site and then turn off the dual origin when you're done. If you have the ability, it's a pretty good strategy for doing things like that. But there's drawbacks to it, like there would be with anything. It's the cost of having a second production server that you can use and is, is uh, capable of handling your site traffic. And we currently have two production configurations that are capable of, of, um, of hosting our content. So the cost of that might not be available to everyone. And you have the labor cost of managing that as well. So we have two servers that we're worrying about all the time. The migration could take longer this, this way. I feel like that's a benefit, but there could be, there are probably some people in the organization that don't feel like that's been a benefit, uh, that this is taking longer. Um, and you may see stakeholders being a little bit impatient uh, as they want to see their section get to the new site quicker and they just have to wait their turn. And we are now complete, so uh, and we're on time. Does anyone, if anyone has any questions, you can ask now or you can catch up with us later. Nikki. It seems as though you're going from a neighborhood that doesn't have an HOA yeah. to a neighborhood that does have one, right? So let's think of the USWDS as the HOA. They're controlling what you're allowed to do in this new house, et cetera. Because you've lived in this old house for 10 years, you've customized it to what you want it to be, whether it worked or not, you found a workaround for that. How do you take that moving into the new house? Do you just scrap it? Do you find something comparable just so the sake of the migration time? You know, because you don't want to talk things out. So how do you approach those customized modules, those customized codes? Great question. I'm going to repeat the question for the recorder, if I understand it properly. So, the question was, we have a 10-year-old site, Drupal 7, that we've made lots of customizations to in the past. There's lots of custom code. Um, the question is, is, as we're moving those rooms to the Drupal 10 site, what do we do with the functionality that doesn't exist in Drupal 10? Are we spending time to rewrite it or finding new solutions? Uh, or doing it different in Drupal 10? And the answer is yes. So uh, there's some things that we're gonna write custom code for, but our default position, our preferred position, is to find a contrib module that makes sense, and we may have to change that functionality slightly. And that question is coming from the project manager, by the way. <laughs> uh, any other questions? I can't hear your question. I'm talking about. I can try to talk a little louder. I guess, are you doing this project totally in house? Or is there, like, you know, are you, you know, external resources for this? And my second question is, like, how much time did you, did you allow yourself for this? Uh, yeah, okay. So I'll come back up here for the recording. Two part question. Uh, first question was, are we using internal resources? or are we using any external resources? How that is divvied up? So all of the, the development resources in terms of staff is internal. Um, so it's an internal team. Um, the internal team is made up of uh, full-time employees and also contractors, but it's a team that's been together for eight years or so. Um, and we do, in terms of hosting and CDN partners, those are external services and we're not hosting the website ourselves. And the second question was, yeah, how much time did we allot? So that's a hard question. This project started about two years ago, um, and for a number of reasons kind of got paused. Um, those reasons are things like uh, the government has things that, they, that we have to do at certain periods of time content sections of the site that had to change in Drupal 7. 
Um, so the project got paused a little bit, and probably about a year ago, we started to um, be able to dedicate more time to getting that first house built. Uh, and once we put a good amount of time into getting the house built, it probably took three months to get the house in place, three or four months. Are you done now? You want to add to that? Yeah. And then as um, we move uh, new sections, it will be easier and we expect to uh, move faster. The, most of the work at this point is really on the project management side and the content side at this point. There are some sections that we have to write a few migration scripts for, but really it's the, the pace of the business owners at this point. For the base URL issue, did you consider like the pathologic module for the cases where it's content in the body field that can handle that sort of thing? Yeah, no, the question's good. The question was, uh, for the base URL problem, did we look at any modules to help us? Um, so, the base URL issue comes up in a number of places, not the ones that I just mentioned. Um, one, of the, one of the things that we could have done, we experimented with a bunch of these. One is, just change the base URL to be www.atf.gov, right? I could have wrote code that when PHP starts up in a setting file, check, am I on my production server? Am I running in production mode? Switch to base URL. Um, and I experimented with that. The problem, I did, the problem we had with that is that we actually wanted to be able to clearly go to the site as www2 and have it function as www2 independently and then only in a certain situation switch those URLs, which is why we went to custom code route. We did have problems with people embedding, and this is something else you just mentioned, uh, embedding content into a WYSIWYG editor and potentially hard coding links in. So we are using the Linkit module, I think, and a few things to help prevent that, but you still can't completely stop people at all times from sticking a hard coded URL in there. So there is a little bit of training there, and then some custom code that you can write to try to avoid that as much as possible. But that is sort of the, one of the bigger problems we had, but again, I say problem, it was pretty easily solved. Yeah, so how did you manage the search between the two origin servers? Yep. Yeah, so how do we handle search between the two origins? So we're using, uh, what's it called, GovSearch, SearchGov, and they basically are going, looking at our um, site map.xml file. So once we solve our site XML file problems, the search automatically gets fixed. We're not searching, doing a Drupal search internally on the site. And we do have multiple languages too. I'm not sure we mentioned that in any of the slides. <laughs> uh, but so the site is in Spanish and English. Uh, so that not, wasn't necessarily a challenge with this dual origin, it works. We have Spanish on both sides, but it was another piece that we had to pay attention to. And it didn't help that we switched translation partners in the middle of the process. Yeah, go ahead. Tim, yeah? Do you find yourself using more custom codes to fix stuff in Drupal 10 to perform some functionalities in Drupal 7? I think the question was, are we finding ourselves writing more custom code? The answer would be no. Um, part of that is there was a ton of custom code in the Drupal 7 side. Um, lots and lots of custom code. Um, and I think our approach as a team now in Drupal 7 is to make that the last resort. So, um, and we're not afraid to do it because we did a lot of it in Drupal 7, but we're just trying to stay in line as much as possible now, so the answer is no. And when we write the custom code, as you know, between 7 and 10, it's just way better. So, so another thing is that comparing Drupal 10 and Drupal 7 in terms of translation, the amount of modules we were using in Drupal 7 for translation is like 20 plus modules. Now, taking advantage of Drupal 10 and translation being core, 
it's just easier, easier. Just put a plug in to, and then do translations. Just makes our life easier. And we're not writing custom code for that. Is there one other question? No? We're good. OK. Uh, when you were picking the rooms and figuring out what to do, like, did you ever run into where you had um, your news landing page, but also news shows up on an uh, organization sub page or something like that, where you couldn't migrate the full set of uh, content type, or it didn't work out? Uh, yes. Did you sneak and look at our website? No. <laughs> Yeah, so the question is, uh, do you have situations where you've got content that uh, is basically generated on one site but appears on the other site kind of question? So what we did is we deliberately selected room, the first rooms that didn't do that, and we had to remove some content from the Drupal 7 side for like content types removed to Drupal 10 that can no longer appear in Drupal 7. Um, we do have some strategies to pull that stuff in from Drupal 7 to the from Drupal 10 to the Drupal 7 site. We haven't gotten to the point that we need that strategy yet, but we could do it with some you know JSON feeds and stuff uh, with some JavaScript and pull content in. Um, we're trying to avoid that. Thank uh, thank you very much. Uh,